Once again, hello and welcome to Backstage with Freddie Phillips. Glad to have your company wherever you're watching this, uh, within our five state region or on the web or even social media these days. There's all kinds of different outlets and we uh, certainly appreciate you taking time to watch us. My very, very special guest this week. This, we've been working on this for a few months to make this happen. Uh, one of the finest, finest vocalists you'll ever hear. Uh, you're probably most familiar with his work as a member of the group Exile. I'm talking about Mr. Les Taylor. Les. Hello, Mr. Freddie. How are you? How are you? Doing great. Hello, yes. everybody out there in radio <laughs> and internet and whatever else social media land. <laughs> I can't keep <laughs> up with it. Wherever you are, hello. <laughs> I can't keep up with it, Les. It's changing so fast. Uh, I'm telling you. That's a good thing. I'm still recovering from last night's sold-out show in Prestonsburg, Kentucky at the Mountain Arts Center, uh, the so, Mac. So, so am uh, I, for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these guys just tore the place up. Um, of course, great crowd, sold-out crowd, and Exile, one of the few, I guess, remaining groups and artists that uh, really try to reach out to their fans and at the end of the show stick around and sign autographs and meet their fans, stay connected with their fans till the last one leaves. I believe you signed autographs about as long as you played last night, which was about three or four hours total. It felt like it. It felt like I think, Big lines. I think we, our show ended up being a little over two hours long, uh, which that, that's what I like. I, I, like to do, I like to do the longer shows because uh, it takes a while for me to get warmed up. <laughs> so... Um, uh, it, it was it was good. Yeah, we, we spent some time out there with uh, with the folks uh, after the show, and it was uh, it was really nice. It was really good to to come back home. It'd been like seven years since we had played uh, at the Mountain Arts Center in Prestonburg, and it, it, was, it was it was good. We, the band has the band has done well in in that region for a long time. I mean, you know, Eastern Kentucky up in there around Hazard and Prestonburg, and uh, and, and and it's it's good. It's good to, good to come back. And, and play for those folks. That is great. I know you have a tremendous fan base here in southwest Virginia and east Tennessee and southern West Virginia mm -hmm. and western North Carolina. That's our surrounding region right here for okay. where we are centered at here in Norton, Virginia. Mm -hmm. You have a tremendous fan base. I've been a part of that fan base even though <laughs> that I have uh, played your music on radio full-time and part-time for since 1983. Actually, something I'm proud of, the very first single was high cost of leaving was released to radio the month i was hired as a teenage yeah. pup oh yeah and uh, so i've rode most of those oh, songs making, with you guys now you're making me feel old so and so. we can talk all about that but you're making me feel old too but that's when exile went country and we can go all into that a little bit later but you just said something before we came on that just uh, kind of kindled my mind a little bit you say your dad's folks are from harlan kentucky yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, my uh, my dad. Uh, I think I, I don't. I think I think he was born in Harlan County. Uh, my grandfather was in the coal mining uh, uh, mm -hmm. industry up there. He he didn't, he didn't he didn't own a mine or anything like that. But he was he was one of the workers in the mines, and and that was right around. Uh, when the time that the unions were coming in and, and there was people that was pro-union and then there was people that was against the union and he was he was one of the guys that was for the union and he he met uh, an ill-fated death because of it oh, yeah it was, i was going to say uh, that was a war zone yeah he was actually gunned down right on the street oh my goodness. yeah because he was he was one of the uh, uh, big uh, uh, advocates for uh, for union and uh, so but not to get into anything really heavy, but uh, yeah, that's that's what happened to him. Uh, I never knew my grandfather. I, I never knew my grandfather on my dad's side or my grandmother on my mother's side, which was kind of strange. But uh, yeah, my my dad's folks are from uh, from uh, Harlan County, and uh, yeah, well, I used to go up in there and play uh, quite a bit uh, when I first started out playing music. Yeah. I was going to ask you. Uh where you were born and raised, uh, mostly around the London, Kentucky area, right? Mm -hmm. I was born uh, in Oneida, o Oneida, tomato, tomato, <laughs> whatever, uh, depending on where you're from. It's, uh, I call it Oneida, Kentucky. It's uh, in Clay County, uh, which is, I think Oneida is between Manchester and Hyden. 
and uh, of course Hyden, Kentucky is Leslie County, and Leslie is my name. Now I wonder where they got that. <laughs> when all of my other brothers will have names like Charlie and Earl and Dean and Estel, how do they get Leslie? I don't know. But anyway, that 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 might be there might be something to that. I never asked my mom how how they came up with my name. But anyway, yeah, I was born in Oneida, Kentucky, which is Clay County, like I said, and I, and I was. Um, Raised uh, in Laurel County, which is uh, London. We had a, I grew up on a 40-acre farm um, about halfway between London and Manchester uh, wow. in a little community called Lake, Kentucky. Lake? Kentucky. Lake, yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, you, and you were born into a rather large family. I was. I was. I'm the youngest of nine kids. Uh, There's uh, five boys and four girls in the family. Wow. Yeah. My dad was one of ten. That's the way it was yep. once that's upon a time. Tough, uh, that's a tough adventure, uh, raising nine kids in, in, in back in the uh, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s. That was amazing. Uh, you know, depression, obviously, you know. Yeah. And, uh, we wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to do if something like that happened now. I mean, people had to, had to literally make certain, certain things that they cooked with, I guess, you know, Raise back in the day. Food. Yeah, and you know, uh, of course, I think I don't know. There were certain products that you cooked with that you couldn't buy back in in the Depression. I guess I don't know. I don't know exactly what those were, but you know, it's 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 pretty hard. To, you know, it's, it'd be tough to it'd be tough for a rich man to to raise nine kids, let alone a a coal miner, a farmer, and and his wife. You know, that's uh, it's pretty tough. That is amazing. Yeah. Well, Les, you grew up in a large family. When do you first pick up? A musical instrument well I remember uh, I was uh, my uh, my older siblings they went off when I was still really young up into the north Indianapolis and Illinois uh, Indiana Illinois and to find work in the in the factories up there because there just wasn't anything to do in London Kentucky you know in those days uh, work-wise, unless you did want to work the mines or whatever, you know, the coal mines and whatever. But I, I was, my, uh, one of my older sisters and her husband had come home to visit, and he, he strummed around on guitar a little bit, and, and he had an acoustic. I was, uh, I was in bed with strep throat, of all things. I was out of school a few days with that. Um, and... Uh, he, he was trying to trying to make me feel better, I guess, or whatever, and he was trying to teach me G chord, the open G chord on the on the acoustic. <laughs> and I, he showed me he showed me the fingerings <laughs> and all that stuff, which is pretty simple, you know, and uh, placing three three finger placing on the guitar and and uh, and the um, uh, third fret and <laughs> second and third fret. Anyway, he showed me the chord, and I went. And I fingered it down, and then went <laughs> nothing. Nothing happened. You couldn't even hear. You couldn't hear one string, let alone all six or whatever, five of them. And so that was my last encounter with the guitar for about another, I'd say, year and a half. Um, and I have a first, uh, first cousin that's from August to December older than me, so. We, we hung out a lot together and stuff, and uh, as my dad's brother's son. And uh, he, my uncle had an acoustic guitar. I think it was a K, F hole, arch top acoustic guitar. And uh, we started fooling around with it one day. When I remembered, uh, uh, even though it had been a year and a half, I remembered the, 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 the fingering for the G chord, the open G chord. And I. I got the guitar and I hit that chord, and when I when I struck when I struck the the strings, it just rang right out. I thought, "Holy cow, <laughs> man!" So, Were you singing? So that at this time? no 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 just, huh, just no, learning no, the instrument. No, I, I don't. I, I was probably singing maybe around the house or whatever, <laughs> or singing to the radio. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, but. No, we, so we started fooling around, we started fooling around with the acoustic guitar, and one thing led to another, and we, you know, there was my uncle owned a tire shop down in, in North London, and, and people would come in there that, that knew how to play a guitar or a banjo or something like that, and we would 
we would stay on them, at, at getting them to show us chords and stuff like that. So we basically started playing at the same time. We were about 12 and a half years old, I guess, and uh, uh, got got the bug. And and so uh, I was about we we started playing and we and we and we started learning pretty quick. Uh, and so we put a little band together and we did all instrumental stuff. Uh, were and, you uh, surrounded by bluegrass and gospel? Oh yeah, what, yeah, what, yeah. what kind of music? Oh, oh yeah, well yeah, gospel music for sure. Because my my mom and dad, uh, they were strong Christian folks, and and they had me in church every time the doors opened. <laughs> me and the and the and, and the rest and, of and them. the rest of the siblings that were at home. If you were if you were living under their roof, you went to church, and which <laughs> that's a, that's a beautiful thing. It was a good thing. Yeah. And uh, so uh, yeah, gospel music, bluegrass music for sure. Um, uh, and then my mom and I, I remember, uh, we would listen to the Grand Ole Opry on Friday nights on, on the radio. Uh, wow. Yeah, back when T. Tommy was the announcer on there. T. Tommy Cotrere. I, I guess. That was I his just name. knew him as T. Tommy. I never T. Tommy had a last Cotrere, name. <laughs> and um, he was uh, an announcer, yep. if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. from Louisiana for uh, many years on the Opry, and uh, he even was the... Uh, First announcer for the Porter Wagner show. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. amazing talent. Amazing talent. Yeah, he had a great, talent. great announcer's voice like that. MC voice, you know. He was, he was radio. So that's when, about 15 years like of age, you're really picking up the instrument and starting to sing. Yeah, a bit. about about 14, I guess. We started our our, our own. We put together our own our, our little instrumental group, like I said, and then we we had this guy that was kind of. Uh, Acting as manager for us, <laughs> so we were down in the in the bottom of my uncle's tire shop. We used to rehearse down there around. We'd set up around all the re tire recapping machines, and and that's where we rehearsed. So wow. this guy came down there one night. We were playing, and he I remember he came in. He said, "Okay, somebody's going to have to start singing." And so they all looked at me. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> But anyway, I became the singer of the band at that point. And I remember the first song I ever sang was California Sun by the Sun Rays. Wow. Well, I'm going out west where I belong. <laughs> <I'm going down. laughs> yeah, so that, I became a singer at that point. <laughs> Not a very good one either, I must say. Wow. No, I don't know about that. No, I'll yeah, argue on well, that one. <laughs> uh, that, was, well, that was back in the day. <laughs> back in the day, you know. Yeah. We're talking 15 yes, years sir. old or so forth. Wow, and then that leads you to, I would imagine, I mean, Elvis Presley, the Beatles are taking the world over. Um, you're 15, what happens? Uh, well, I was, I, was a huge, I was a huge fan of the Beatles. I, I love the Beatles. When the first time I heard, I want to hold your hand, it, it was like, what is this? <laughs> I mean, you know, we've never heard any guitar no. riffs like that. Dun, 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 dun. I mean, it was just, it was so different and alive, I guess, is the right word to describe it. Uh, energetic, you know, a lot of energy. And uh, man, that, that just blew my mind out. The, the real earlier Beatles stuff I really liked. Uh, then they sort of, like a lot of other artists, started getting into some, the heavier stuff, you know, which, I, you know, at, at some point, at some point I started, I mean, I loved the Rolling Stones and the Beatles, but at some point I started veering off into like Wilson Pickett and Otis Redding. Uh, I loved James Brown and uh, anything, anything R&B like that. Those those uh, artists I really, really liked, you know, a lot. And we can tell that these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm influenced pretty good by it. I, I you know, I, I can't, I can't sing it, but I, no, I'm, you uh, sell I'm yourself too short. Anyway. <laughs> This man last night, of course, and hopefully you catch these guys exile in concert. They don't just do their country hits and, of course, some of their rock and roll hits. They do other material, and uh, they do a Motown. <laughs>
the songs by the Temptations, Four Tops, um, Stevie Wonder. I'm sure I'm leaving somebody out. No, uh, I think you covered it. You, it's a, yeah, it's a, but I love the new medley you've added uh, over the last couple of years. Yeah. We call uh, it. We call it. Arrow, what do you call it? We call it the Arrow Jones medley because we <laughs> we do we do uh, we start off with Roy Orbison and then we do uh, um, uh, oh my God Fleetwood Mac mm -hmm. and then we go into Aerosmith and then we do He Stopped Loving Her Today the George Jones song then we go into Listen to the or, or to uh, Oki from Muskogee yeah. <laughs> and Merle Haggard then we do Listen to the Music. And then we do "Good Loving" by the Young Rascals, and that closes it out. But it's it's a fun it's a, it's fun, a fun medley. medley. It's a fun medley to do, and and the other R and B medley that we do is, is is a Motown medley that we've we've done off and on for uh, since 1982. Uh, as a matter of fact, when we were doing uh, showcases for uh, for Epic Records back uh, back in uh, uh, in uh, mid to late '82. That they that's one that's one of the things they love most about us is that <laughs> actually, sold we were you doing that, that to yeah, a country level. I, it, yeah, it really did. It really did. Wow, it really did. I guess they figured if we could do that, we could do country music or whatever. But and I would uh, imagine that, that had something to do with the first single. You've heard me say this privately. I love the first single, High Cost of Leaving. You were singing lead on that. It's got George Jones wrote, wrote all over it. Mm -hmm. Very soulful, very country. Song made it to number 27, which is pretty good. Top 40, first release out from a former rock band, pop band. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now they're country, but I would imagine that they heard something there in the R&B to send them I, down towards George Jones. I, I, I guess so. I guess so. But they they were really impressed with that, with the fact that we did a, we did that Motown medley and did it so well. But back then we did a Beatles medley too, and 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 uh. Everly Brothers medley, and it was, it was really cool. It was really cool to do all of that stuff because some of that stuff I'd never played before. None of us had, you know. And so it was really, it was really cool to, to, to work that stuff up and do it. Uh, uh, but uh, the high cost of leaving, going back to that, that, that song was written by JP and Sonny, our bass player, and, and a guy that used to be in this band called, his name was Mark Gray. But that song was written for that song was written for George Jones. They were going to pitch that song to him, and then we decided that we were going to start doing country music and go that route. And so we held the song for ourselves and didn't pitch it to him. But it, it's it's very uh, George Jones esque, if you will. And uh, I got to sing it. I, I loved I loved singing that song. It was kind of rangy, and uh, and that's what I like. You know, uh, but yeah, it's it was it was definitely heavily influenced uh, George Jones uh, influences for sure. And see, I never knew and that. And if that song would have been, I I really sorry for interrupting, but I feel like if that song could have been the maybe second or third single after we'd sort of broke the ice yeah. with, the, with the country radio, I feel like that song would have been a, a much bigger hit than it was. I agree too. Yeah. Like I said, I was a teenager, but I was starting to learn learn how things operated in Radio Bank then. Um, that but I want to back up 
here we were from 15 years of age all the way to our first country <laughs> single. Yeah. You're playing, let's move into when you're playing, by the, some, at some point, I don't know, maybe after high school or college or somewhere, you, you are playing in a band. Uh, why don't you touch on that for a moment? And if I, and I, I skimmed through one of the Exile books last night, I, and I've read it before, but it, it wasn't J.P. Pennington, the, the, the lead singer, of course, the other lead singer, and pretty much the... the uh, the only original member left from '63. Mm -hmm. Yeah. JP doesn't he approach you in a club mm -hmm. when Exile is looking for a lead singer, and ended up hiring two lead singers. That's yeah. a whole different story. Yeah, but were, let's let's go back to when. Yeah. Let's go from your 15 to meeting. Then I don't know what the gap is. Five, ten years, whatever. To meeting JP, can you kind of fill me in on that? Well, yeah. Well, I was playing with a group out of Corbin, Kentucky, at the time group called the ovations and we were playing up we were playing up in here a lot the and, ovations uh, mm -hmm. okay we were playing in uh at the martin youth center as a matter of fact in, okay. in, uh, uh, in, in martin kentucky all right uh martin county mm -hmm. i think it's martin county down there there is a martin yeah. kentucky and then there is a martin county well, i martin know County's Martin, Inez is Martin County. Okay, well, Martin, Mar uh, Martin, Martin is in Martin, Hyman, Kentucky yeah. is where we played. Then okay. it was called the Martin Youth Center. David Lee Grigsby was the owner yeah. of that place. He was a great saxophone player. <laughs> Man, this guy was a great saxophone player. But anyway, we we were playing there, and like a couple couple of weekends during during our run of playing there. Uh, on weekends, we, we would set up on one end of the floor and Exile would set up on the other end of the floor. Now, JP wasn't with the band then, but anyway, <clears throat> sort of fast forward a little bit. I mean, I got to know those guys, and then oh, about 1967, I guess it was, 66, 67, they were, Exile used to, they used to play at Specs in Richmond, and uh, a little bar down there, a college bar, and, and uh, uh, JP was, he was with the band then, he had come back to the band, uh, uh, and, and so he was playing bass, he was playing bass in the band. <laughs> Mike Howard was the guitar player, when Mike got, he, 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 during that time, when I got to know all of them, um, Mike got drafted to, he, he was getting drafted, so he joined the Air Force, I think is what it was. So. Uh, he leaves the band, JP, they didn't have a guitar player. JP was playing bass, and so I, went, I was over there one night, and I didn't even know JP played guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so I, I told him that night, I said, man, I, you know, I understand Mike's gone off to the service and stuff like that. And I said, if you guys uh, uh, decide to hire a guitar player, I said, I sure would like a shot at it. And uh, <laughs> so, and, and so, yeah, you know, I... You know, that didn't happen. Years went by, and so this was about '67 there in Vietnam. Yeah, and then yeah, and then so so I went off up to Indianapolis and started playing on a honky tonk up there the fall of my 19th birthday, and I stayed up there for two years. Came back to Lexington, started playing at a club called Marty's, out on Richmond Road out there, and and uh, I stayed there for. Uh, I was there off and on for about two and a half years, and then I went across town, started playing at another club, then I started going working with some show bands, different show bands, out on the road and stuff, just kind of trying to get better. Well, 1978, I was up in Canada with a 10-piece horn band, show band, and uh, wow. things were, just wasn't working out. I, you know, I, was, I, was, I wasn't happy with the band, and they were trying to do original music, but it, it was nothing commercial or that was going to get us to radio or anything like that, I didn't think anyway. So I, I became disenchanted with that, so I left, and came back to Lexington, and I started playing uh, uh, in, a, in a club in Lexington called the Camelot Lounge out on, in, in the Gardenside Shopping Center on the uh, west side of town. And, and, and uh, that was 1978, September, I think it was. I started playing there with those guys, and then uh, 79 rolls around, and uh, again, I was disenchanted because a couple of members had left the band and we replaced them with a drummer that I wasn't, that I had worked with before. And I tried to convince the guys that we shouldn't hire the guy because yeah. I knew what it was like and I knew it would be problems and stuff. And sure enough, it was. So there again, I just became unhappy and I knew, 
you know, that, that, that this thing wasn't, you know, wasn't, wasn't going to happen. And so I actually gave him an ultimatum, you know, we need to find somebody else to play drums or I'm going to go because I just, I, I can't, I can't deal no. with this. <laughs> and, uh, and they said, well, we don't want to replace him. And I said, well, then, then you have my two-week notice. And the next week, it was Thursday night, we used to have a talent night over there. And, and there was at some point somebody came up and was playing guitar. So I was off stage at that point. And, and JP had come in. He was standing back in the back listening to us. I walked off stage and went up and started talking to him. And during that conversation, he, he said, man, we, we're, we're, uh, we're going to hire uh, somebody to 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 uh, come into the band. We're going to hire another guitar player, and he said, "I just wondered if you might be interested." And I said, "Yes," because I said I just gave my two-week notice with these guys. <laughs> so I and started you playing. You didn't know what he was thinking. No, 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 no. Oh, and, no, and I, he didn't I, know no, what I had no idea. This is, I, I mean, in 1966, I think it was. I told him that <laughs> I'd like to have the job and whatever. What, 15 years, almost wow. 15 years later, or whatever, <laughs> 12, yeah. 13 years later, he about comes 13. in. And, yeah, and uh, uh, and offered me the job. So, so yeah, I mean, I didn't have anywhere to go. It, I just knew that I was disenchanted with this, and I just wasn't going to stay there because it wasn't good for my head, you know. We uh, go from, like, 1967 to, was this 79 or 80? 79. Well, July 79 is when he offered me the gig. My first, I, I, So I started I started rehearsing with them uh, the, the latter part of July of 79, and... Um, we rehearsed for a couple of weeks. Mark Gray started playing with the band the very same day that I did. <laughs> they hired both of us. We became a seven-piece band at that point. Uh, three keyboard players, two guitars, bass, and drums. And so I've often wondered what that was like to work with. Uh, kind of chaotic. Whoa, anyway, well, that's we what it sounded. <laughs> we won't go there. But anyway, uh, so Mark and I started playing with the group the very same day, started rehearsing the very same day with the band. and, and um, uh, so we rehearsed for a couple of weeks and learned the songs, the harmonies, got them all together and tightened them up and stuff. And our first gig, Mark and I's first gig with the band was opening for England Dan and John Ford Coley at the DuCorn, Illinois State Fair. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Learjet, boom. <laughs> back home. We played at, <laughs> we played at 8 o'clock. I was back home in my, in, in, in my, in my house about 11, 11.30. <laughs> Prior to that, I thought, oh, yeah, man, this is the line. <laughs> you you'd mentioned being up in Canada. I don't know what that was like. But from what I gather, you go from playing clubs to now you're opening internationally. Am yeah. I right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. It's, <laughs> but, you know, there's a whole lot of years in there that I've worked to getting to that point. <laughs> but they were you small know. crowds, I'm sure. Pardon me? Small crowds. Yeah. But you oh, go from yeah, those yeah. venues it all, to it was all this. Club, it was all club work, you know, whatever you wow. can fit in a club, which back in those days was probably a couple hundred people, yeah. you know, sometimes three, maybe four hundred people. But, uh, but, you know, unless you, yeah, even if you played a fair, you were playing a small stage over in the corner somewhere while the national acts were playing up there. So, yeah, we didn't, we, I wasn't playing in front of in, in many people at all, you know. And, and to preface and, this, let me back up one year. In 1978, which next year marks the 40th anniversary of the song that changed Exile Forever, mm -hmm. Kiss You All Over had been released yep. and became not just an American, but a international, worldwide, number one smash single. And here you are, one year later after the release, <laughs> yeah. right in the middle of this. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was... It was it was pretty nice, you know. I, uh, I, I missed I missed the 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 Aerosmith tour, the the um, um, Sills and Crofts shows, and uh, Player, and some of those deals. You know, the Heart. They they they, they did uh, uh, they did uh, uh, some shows with Heart. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that that would have been that would have been nice. But it's you know I've. Uh, I've done some some neat stuff with the band, you know. After after starting with them, and August August tenth was a Friday night, nineteen seventy nine, and that was when we opened for England Dan and John Ford Collie. That's a good stopping point for just a br <laughs> don't go anywhere. I was going to stop this earlier, but it was just too good to stop. So <laughs> let's take a quick break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more from our very special guest backstage, Les Taylor of Exile.
special edition of Backstage with Freddie Phillips from Norton, Virginia. Of course, I still do the radio broadcast out of here uh, at least once a week, sometimes more, at 93.5 WAXM and WAXM.com. And, of course, we appreciate the folks at ARC TV uh, helping us out as well. Les Taylor, my very special guest. Most of you know him as a uh, one of the lead singers and guitarist for the group Exile worldwide known band over the years and when we left in our last break of course Les had joined Exile and Mark Gray had joined so we get two lead singers <laughs> I don't know about the price yeah. of one uh, but anyway we go from one lead singer to two yeah you and, can pretty uh, much say that I guess but Exile is <laughs> looking uh, I mean they had already had huge success as far as South Africa of all places uh, number one song but just like in a lot of rock and roll stories, things don't always go like the Beatles or Elvis. <laughs> You'll have a few hits, and then yep. then you can't buy a hit, it seems like. I, I don't know. Yeah. You're putting out the same kind of music, good stuff, but something's not working. Uh, what happened in that, during that area, during that era? What, hey, what? You, you know, a number of things can happen, you know, uh, either label is not promoting you, they don't believe in you, even though they signed you and they paid for you to do a record. That happens. It just yeah. it happens. It, and I don't understand. I don't understand why it happens unless they just need a write off or something like that. Whatever whatever that the the situation may be. But we you know, I I don't know. It's um, I don't know much of the history of, of how Exile signed with Warner Curb Records yeah. at that point in time, you know, and I don't know what all went into that and what, what, what the total story is behind that at that point, but really, Kiss You All Over was a great song. It, it still holds up today. Uh, production's great on it. Mike Chapman, he and his partner, writing partner, Nicky Chen, wrote the song. Mike Chapman was the producer of the, of the band, so he produced that uh, that album, uh, Mixed Emotions, it's great. It, like I said, it, it still holds up today. But that song came out right, right as disco. That the, the disco era was was happening, was beginning to take hold. So you had disco music and heavy metal which was pretty much eating the market up at that point you know you had some pop artists and stuff like that but uh, it was just uh, you know after kiss you all over it was the best thing that ever happened to the band uh, but i think it kind of uh, i think it may have pigeonholed the band to to like indicate that they were a disco group which they weren't it was a pop band but you can get labeled really quick. So we weren't a disco group and we weren't a heavy metal group. So um, I, th I, I think that's I think that's where we got caught is in between those in between those two genres of music. Uh, seems to be anyway. But you know it happens. It you know it happens that artists have a, a, a strong first outing, first single that does what Kiss You All Over did, number one for four weeks in the pop charts, sold four million singles. That's back when people bought singles, 
<laughs> yeah. The 45. 45 RPM. Yeah. And, you know, it's just, it's hard to follow a song that that creates that kind of buzz, you know. Right. Uh, book because you know you you've all you set the bar pretty high at that point <laughs> so you know it's uh and, and i just think it's uh, i think it, it, it i think it really buried us you know one in, thing in about one thing about exile the band I always i said if if there's one word to attach beside of exile it's survivors this band has survived i believe every storm that could hit it from at least from my viewpoint from the outside mm -hmm. looking in mm -hmm. not being a member or on the inside yeah. but this band has survived so many times all right you survived from 79 through 82 by 83 i'm gonna go back to where we were <laughs> uh, high cost of leaving epic records part of columbia cbs group has signed exile to a country deal buddy killen does a wonderful job producing along with you guys, playing your own instruments, I might add, writing your own songs, mm -hmm. and the number ones start happening. Not just top ten, the number ones. You guys go on a roll, like nine in a row. Mm -hmm. Country success, it just seems natural for this group. Mm -hmm. But I want to back up for a second. You co-wrote one of the greatest country songs I ever heard. <laughs> and Thank Janie you. Fricky mm -hmm. took it all the way to number one. It ain't easy being easy. Love that song then, still love it today. Thank you. And congratulations thank on writing Thank you very that. much. Thank you. Yeah. So yes. no wonder Nashville finally catches up. You guys are on the Nashville label. Mm -hmm. and But how did it feel during that era? Now you're back in business, but you're on the country side of things. But does it start feeling here we are again, night after night, we're playing somewhere and all the success is coming? Is it like being on some sort of spaceship or rocket ship or fast yeah, train it's, it's kinda, does it, it like it, a blur it, it, it's it's unbelievable and and uh you know when you're working you're working so much and recording so much and all oh, it's just kind of hard it's it it really is kind of hard to take it all in because you know you're only as good as your last three minutes and 20 seconds or 40 seconds whatever it is now it might be four minutes today i don't know but <laughs> You know, you're, you're you're having to you're having to work so much and, and 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 keep up with so much. You know, the songwriting had to had to keep going, and of course, J, JP and Sonny were doing the majority of that. So, uh, um, you know, they would be able to tell you about that end more than me. Uh, you know, as far as trying to trying to keep up with everything, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's exhausting and it's fun and it's crazy and <laughs> and everything else you know and uh, uh, but uh, you know it having gone through a little bit of a waning period there after uh, between 78 or 79 and and 82 when we like we were playing we were playing at the bowling alley lounge in, in lexington in 1982 we started there on january 8th 1982 which was a friday night uh, I never forget it. <laughs> we had, How big is this place? I it was a 175 it. seat venue. 170. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, wow. uh, yep. And so we played there, off and on for the, for the year of '82. Uh, and uh, uh, so when when we eventually got signed to Epic Records and started recording and stuff like that, we had we had been. We had been in a studio, this little studio, Limco Recording Studios in Lexington, a little 16-track studio, and we had been in there uh, demoing songs, that, that original songs and stuff, you know, and uh, uh, so when we, we got the, when we got the record deal, we were kind of, we were kind of ready to roll with it, you know, because uh, we had some songs, you know, that, that, were, that were ready. Um, but uh, but it was uh, you know it was it was it was an exciting time and uh, and boy we we worked we worked the road the first first couple three years we were I remember I think one year we worked 200 shows wow and uh, and that's that's play dates that's not track 
or travel, that travel time. It's or? not travel time. That's so it was. It was. It was crazy. It was. <laughs> it was. It was crazy to say the least. Yeah. But it was. But it was fun, exciting, and and uh, wary, uh, wearisome. <laughs> Less. <laughs> it will it, wear you down. That's for sure. Less mentions they were in a little studio and they demoing songs and so forth. For those of you younger listeners and so forth, or some of you that just may have forgotten. Exile had the original version of Heart and Soul that Huey Lewis and the News basically kept the same structure of the song, same vocal, everything, except put themselves inside of it, and it became a number one song for them and helped break them into a whole new level in rock and roll with an album called Sports. Alabama records Take Me Down and The Closer You Get, written by Exile. Go back and listen to the original versions by Exile basically the same you just change <laughs> change a guy but yeah. it's the same sound same chords uh everything and that was amazing itself but i'm sure like you say that keeps you guys going during a yeah. period of time and boy it mm -hmm. keeps you going these days too it's, it's nice to have some mailbox money right there i'm sure yeah, with it's, those songs. it's good it's good for the writers of those songs to to be picked up you know those, those songs were on a pop on the uh, album called don't leave me this way which was was one of the pop albums that we did, and and Take Me Down was released. We released that song, and uh, and it 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 did did okay regionally, you know, but uh, not enough, not enough, obviously. And uh, so Alabama picked those two songs up and cut them, and they were to two of Alabama's biggest records True. to date. You know? True. Mm -hmm. Now I'm jumping up to about 1986, 87. Exile, I guess the label, somebody makes the decision to do a Greatest Hits album. They put a couple of new songs on the Greatest Hits album. Uh, you guys even re-record Kiss You All Over, and you had a part of that. Mm -hmm. And Oh, I love that version. Thank you. Really radio-friendly. Yeah, it, it, it turned out good. Really Three-and-a-half-minute gym right there. Mm -hmm. You and Les uh, singing lead and, and playing guitars JP. on right there. Yes, uh, you and JP. <laughs> yeah. Les and JP. <laughs> Yeah. And in memory of Jimmy Stokely, it was dedicated on the original lead singer on, on that greatest hits album. Exactly. But now I move into this. Somebody, I don't know who makes the decisions with the label, the band, whatever, but thankfully they release It'll Be Me and they release She's Too Good to Be True. Two of Exile's biggest songs. This man's vocals are on them. I don't know how many takes it took to get either one of those songs but it <laughs> sounds like they were done on the first take they still hold the test of time and if I memory serves me correct one or both of them was song of the year in some of the trades I know when I was in radio full-time one or both songs were either in the running or one song of the year Les congratulations man I Thank still you. love those songs you Thank guys you. still do them in Thank concert you. yep yeah, it'll be me. Was there's a pub, there's a publication called Radio and Records. It's another R and R. It's, it's yeah. It's another uh, chart magazine, uh, and uh, uh, with besides Billboard magazine, uh, Radio and Records. And it, this it'll be me was Song of the Year in Radio and Records. Uh, interesting um, scenario with She's Too Good to Be True. The, the reason that song was released. I, I wanted that song to be released instead of Super Love. Uh, we, were, we, were trying to, we were trying to figure out, and the label was asking us, they, asked, they actually asked us our, our input <laughs> on what we thought should be the next uh, single. At that point, we had had eight number ones in a row. So we started thinking about it, and we would be out on the road. I remember talking to Steve, our drummer, and, and saying, you know, I, I really feel strongly that She's Too Good to Be True should be a single. We haven't had a ballad out in four years. If, if for no other reason, uh, I felt like that we should show another side of us and have that song come out as a single. Plus the fact I thought it was a great song. Not because I sang it. Any, a hit song doesn't care who sings it. No. So uh, I, I was pitching heavy for that, you know. And I remember us going in a conference room at, at the label and sitting around this big table and everybody giving their input and all that stuff. And, well, at the end of the day, Super Love was the song that was the choice 
to release. And it broke our string of number one record. It went to 14. Uh, okay, well then, like you said, 87 rolls around. They wanted, they decided to put out a Greatest Hits album on us, okay? And then, so that's, that's fine, that's cool. So they did that, and we found ourselves between a Greatest Hits album and a forthcoming album and also looking for a different producer. So the label decided that to, to keep us in uh, radio and stuff, and I think, to my understanding, it, it, was, it, it was for no other reason than that, that they released She's Too Good to Be True. <laughs> and She's Too Good to Be True went straight to number one. And I'm not saying I know everything and all that. But I was it there. Felt, it was number one. It just felt right to me to have a ballad at that point in time, especially a good ballad. And we had we had we recorded some good ballads on those on those uh, uh, projects that were never even never, dis released. never even discussed as singles. But you know, <laughs> I don't know. You never know. But you know, if you have a feeling about something, you've got to you you've got to uh, make it known. And and I did. But you know, it was obviously it didn't go it didn't go the way that I wish it would have went but eventually she's too good to be true she's too good to be true was released and it went straight to number 1 which uh, uh, validates my choice you know for that you know and I'm happy about that not so much that, that I sang it like I said but the fact that it, it was another number 1 record for us and uh, you know just it just lends more credence to the whole organization you know something good like that happens you know, one of my personal favorites. It'll be me. Yep. What's the story behind that? Really? Well, gosh, I, I, I really I don't know. If Somewhere in this story. time frame, it gets released, uh, and you're on lead vocal. Well, again. yeah. Well, but but they, you know, at that at that point in time, I I don't know which song. I I'm, I have to tell you, I don't know which song. <laughs> Go back and look first. at the sequence. You know, the Hang On to Your Heart too good album. Good to be true. Was after it'll be me. Right? Or, I think or, so. Or was From it? the Hang On To yeah, Your Heart I guess, album. Yeah, I guess it was. Because we I, went from the sure, greatest hits honest. from 86 to 87. That's, and then, of strange. course, by 88, of course, that's a whole different ball game. New producer, yeah. new yeah. album. You guys yeah. are going to Northeast Recording and all of that. Uh, how much time we got remaining right here? I want to jump into modern times before we run out of time for this hurry. interview. <laughs> Excuse me? All right. Well, it is time to move into that. But, Les, congratulations on all that. So we went from childhood to uh, our teenage years into superstardom and, of course, the group exile. But the main reason we're here today on Backstage, and I am so excited, so excited to be a part of this, what this man is doing in his personal life. This man is singing some wonderful gospel Christian music, and you've got you. a such an inspiring, powerful number, for lack of better words. If that mountain don't move, mm -hmm. and I challenge each and every one of you to look that up at Les Taylor Music, go to Facebook, go to social media, Les Taylor Music, or YouTube maybe, to hear this man sing this powerful song. Congratulations Thank you. on that, man. I, Thank you, Freddie. I appreciate it. I didn't mean to save it towards the end, but <laughs> I guess that's the way it was meant to be. Yeah, sure. But uh, yeah, who wrote that song? Did you write that? No. Uh, there's a gospel group called the Crab Family. Okay. Very familiar And with the patriarch of that family is a guy by the name of Gerald, Gerald. Crab. He, he is the father of all the singers that are in that band that has been in that band they are now doing stuff on their own yes. adam aaron jason uh i'm not sure debbie i think is one of them's name i'm not sure what the girl's names are i'm more familiar with the with yeah. the with the male, adam, aaron. The, the the adam aaron and jason yeah, yeah. Uh, uh than i am the girls uh but uh gerald gerald crab wrote this song uh how did you get this it's from a, him? Well, it, the song is about 12 years old, 12, 13 years old. Gerald cut it back years ago on uh, a project of his. Um, 
but Wendy, my wife, was on Facebook one day, and she somehow got around to seeing Gerald Crabb's Facebook page, and she friended him on Facebook, and they got to they got to corresponding back and forth, and she said, "Well, uh, she said I'm going to uh, be bold and, and and forward and ask you if you <laughs> may have some songs that you could send less because we." We want to do a, a gospel project. And he sent me like seven songs, emailed them, he filed them to me, emailed them to me, whatever, and, and, and I listened to them. And they were all great songs. But if that mountain don't move, the one that I ended up cutting, if it, it just it just really, it really spoke to me. It, it, it said what I wanted to say. It was the kind of song that I wanted to do, which kind of has a, a kind of has a, 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 a blues rhythm and an R&B kind of uh, feel to it, you know, uh, and it's a Southern gospel song, obviously. But it just, it just, it's, it, it said uh, a lot, and uh, so I just fell in love with the song, and uh, uh, one thing led to another, and and I had befriended this this guy down in Arkansas, in Hamburg, Arkansas which is about 20 miles from where uh, uh, Wendy's mom and dad, my wife's mom and dad live. And he, he, was, he was like, uh, he was pastoring a little church down there. And we were down there over the holidays about three years ago. And Wendy had been there again. She had friended him on Facebook. His name, his name is Jamie Coulter. So we went over to his church and, and listened to him preach. And he sang and he's, he's done like six albums or over his over his lifetime, he was born with brittle bone disease. Okay. Uh, and uh, of course he's in a wheelchair and stuff like that, but he, loved, he loves music and he loves the Lord. Well anyway, we got to talking about it. I told him I had a song that I'd just love to cut. So we, in next thing I know, we're in TBN Studios in Andersonville, Tennessee, cutting it. And so we cut the song, we did the track there. Well, we had Angie, Angela Prim, who is just a oh awesome uh, gospel singer, and Jason Crabb came in, did the back vocals on wow. it. Then when I was down in in Arkansas over the holidays uh, last year, uh, Jamie and a friend of his have a little studio down there, so I did the lead vocals down there, and uh, and, uh, and 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 it's out, it's it's out, it it's out to gospel radio, and and it's it's being promoted as we speak, and. And uh, I think it's I, I think it's 63 in uh, in Christian Voice magazine charts. Uh, and uh, uh, singing news, we haven't charted there as of yet, but uh, but we're hoping that's going to change. We're I believe hoping, it will change. We're hoping the Lord's going to work, and uh, and and uh, the way the Lord has been working in my life and my wife's life uh, is just. Uh, incredible and it's uh, it's just a, it's just an awesome thing it, it really that's is. why this interview is happening and yep. i'm sitting right here talking <laughs> to this man uh we didn't know we were going to do this until well really this this week probably but this uh, process started about four months ago yeah unbeknownst to either one of us it yep. was one of those god things yeah and yep. i want to do this this last few minutes les you told me about your upbringing strict Christian mm -hmm. home, but something you got to know Jesus Christ that He's not just part of the past, that He's part of the present and the future. Mm -hmm. Something happened in recent years. Won't you share that? And maybe somebody hurting out there, somebody depressed, somebody needs to hear this. What happens in the life life of Les Taylor? Well, you know, I just. Uh I, I'm like a whole lot of other people in this world that thinks that, 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 that you know, I'm the one that knows best for me, <laughs> you know, and I found out that that's not true. I tried to do things my way, and, and I really took my life in a direction that, I, that it didn't need to go in, and the success of, of the music business helped me to do that. Uh, and then... You have the lack of success, which you have the down times and stuff like that. And 
you know, things happen. I lost my mother, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I lost a brother. I lost my father in, in 1983. I lost my one of my brothers in 1974. I lost my mother in April of 2006. And uh, you know, you, I, I'm a firm believer in the reason people turn to drugs and alcohol and do whatever they do is because they're masking something. They're trying to, they're trying to uh, 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 live with something that's happened, with some sort of grief, you know. Okay. And and I think that's what happened to me. I'm I'm, I'm sure it is. I, I just don't know what other reason it would be. And I took my life in a direction that was bound to kill me if I didn't get a grip on it. And uh, thank God I got a grip on it. And I was, I, was, I was sitting in my apartment one day in Lexington on a Sunday morning. I was channel surfing. And I ran on to John Hagee, Pastor John Hagee, Cornerstone Church in San Antonio, Texas. And... It's the same situation with my wife. It happened at a different time, but it's the same situation with my wife. John Hagee changed my life. He, him, and the Lord, I should yes. say, yeah, because he he gets he gets he gets the glory, obviously. <laughs> but John Hagee, John Hagee is the one that pointed me that way, by by me sitting there on my couch in my living room and and, and watching him on TV, and it just. And, and 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 I felt like I felt like the Lord was right there sitting on the couch with me, and every every I still watch John Hagee on a regular basis, and I don't know I've just I've just never in my life had him, and I'm telling the honest to God's truth, and I go to church, and I have a home church in Lexington, and and uh, and, and that sort of thing, but I've never had a, a minister uh, touch me. The way his uh, a minister's sermons touch me, the way John Hagee's sermons touch me, and and what they do for me, and and obviously what the Lord has done for me and my wife to this point is just absolutely amazing and incredible, and I recommend it highly. <laughs> I recommend him highly to anybody that is hurting, that needs some kind of healing. Whether you, whatever you're dealing with, turn to the Lord because he's, he's the only way. He's the only way. He is the way, the truth. Listen to the rain. Did it fall, my Lord? Now, did it rain? Did it rain? Drip and drop. Drip and drop. Drip and drop. Drip and drop. Well, it rained 40 days, 40 nights without stopping. We will has. do this again. Some Time more flies down the road. when you're having fun. You've heard but that old cliche, this, but it's the truth. This is the <laughs> start of a brand new chapter for you. Yes, sir. And I'm so glad yes, to is. be a small part of this. Thank you, Freddie. Thank God you. bless you. God Thank bless you for you. taking time for each and every one. Ladies and gentlemen, Les Taylor, our very special guest backstage. Good night. God love you.
God bless.